Susie, come up. This is Susie Orbach. Give a warm applause to Susie. <laughs> Susie just uh, came in from London, and uh, Susie is um, an activist, is uh, an author, and she's uh, working as a psychoanalyst since many years. Susie has uh, published a, f a very renowned book 30 years ago, which was uh, Fat as a Feminist Issue, where she really opened up our view on females being either too fat or too skinny and, and uh, really showed that this could be a way as well to protect themselves if they got really fat. And now she just published a new book, which is called Bodies. And because I've been talking a lot, I think I'd ask you immediately, Susie, to tell us a little bit about your book before I ask you some questions. Gosh, I really wish I was in the last panel, but now I'm in my own. Yeah. Um, well. Because part of the reason I wrote the book Bodies was that I've been... Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've been a psychoanalyst for a very long time. I've written a lot about bodies in different kinds of ways, but I am a general practitioner. And I noticed in the last 15, 20 years that whatever problem anybody came in with, whether it was bereavement or loss of a, part, uh, loss of a relationship or trouble with their children or work, that, that, that women and men would say, and of course I hate my body or I have to lose 10 kilos or there's something wrong with my body, as though it was a fact of life that they had to live with. And it was a complete change. These were people who did not come in with body dysmorphia or with eating problems. And I was interested that women now today take for granted that their bodies are going to cause them trouble, that they are living in a kind of body instability. At the same time, I had children and I would notice my gorgeous daughter and all of her friends from the tiny to the Amazonian and their fear and terror of food as though it was something that could do something very terrible to them rather than being a pleasure. And that their bodies, instead of being a place that they decorate and enjoy, were something that they had to watch and be careful of. And so I was really interested in, is this too long an answer? No, not at all. No, 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 I was really ahead. interested in what's happened to bodies in our time. And as a psychoanalyst, we really, think we understand how we get a mind, but we don't really understand how we get a body. But the body isn't just the unfolding of a set of chemical instructions. A body is made in a cultural context, in a particular relationship with particular things around it. So if you grow up in China, you learn how to walk as a Chinese person in your maxillofacial mus muscles are structured that way and you have an attitude and, and emotions that are appropriate to a Chinese baby and, and, and woman. But if you grow up here, we grow up in a very different way. And I was very interested in the influence of modern media and culture and various glamour industries, including not just the fashion industry, the diet industry, the pharmaceutical industry and the food industries, interests in destabilizing girls' and women's bodies, and the impact that that has had through, um, unfortunately, through mothers who themselves have been under assault for the last 30 years by, by industries that make a lot of money by breeding body insecurity. You especially, you, you uh, said that people uh, are exposed to at least 2,000 to 5,000 pictures of... Yeah, but those are old figures. Money. Yeah, all they're old figures. That's that's before. That's at least three years old. Nobody nobody can calculate now today. because of the number of digitally um, deliverers that we and have. Everything is digitally remastered. You say that nearly everything. Well, we as don't far, apart from your magazine Begita, everything we know that we see in the media has been worked on by very talented art directors. But what they're doing with their talent is creating images of people who don't exist. And this is uh, because we are exposed to this. That's true. And because... And when you I don't think we like that, do we? No, we don't like that. And these art directors could be doing really interesting work to actually enhance the diversity and the beauty that is with all of us, but it's not going that way. And what you say is that this industry created some sort of a body hatred, that we're so 
not able to cope with what we have because it's so far away from this idealized, reworked images that we really start to hate our body and permanently work on it. And well, there's a whole industry, right? There's a whole industry, and the body, particularly for younger women, has become something that they, instead of working with their body, their body has become a form of work, a form of labor, and it's become part of their product, and part of, it's a kind of commercialized body in which there is always something wrong. I just made a little film with uh, absolutely gorgeous young women, and we asked them, what don't you like about your body? And they were from many different ethnic groups and they all look gorgeous and they told us, each one of them told us 10 different things. And what do you like about your body? Complete and utter silence. And this is not just something that's happening in the West. This is a very significant hidden export that we're sending all around the world so that women in other cultures, that the growth industries are not just in, our, in the West, but in China, Cosmetic surgery for an extension for the leg is very, very popular if you have money. In Iran, 35,000 women have um, a nose job under the hijab. So uh, in, I, I could go on with statistics. Well, you so said that, that, where was it in Korea when they started having all these Western pictures? How many women Well, in Korea, 50%, and South Korea, 50% of the teenage girls already have the insertion of an eyelid because that is considered modernity, and if, if you, you require it. In Fiji, t uh, US television came in in 1995, and three years later, 11.9% of girls, 12 to 15, were bulimic. And they didn't feel themselves to be victims. I think this is a really important thing to understand that they felt themselves to be actively engaged with the modern global world, that they were being modern, and this was, an, this was an opportunity for them. So it's a very complicated issue. It isn't that we're just passive idiots that who are just surrendering. Of course we are, but we surrender with an energy and a desire to make ourselves in the images that are handed down. Oh, sorry, not handed. In Brazil, um, they handed it the other way around. They're financing to women who have problems with small breasts. They're financing the breast uh, enlargement, the silicones, uh, because they say it's less expensive than going to somebody like you than financing a psychoanalyst. So that's quite, a, I quite an interesting approach. I think in Argentina you have to... one procedure every two years you're allowed to have. One I procedure every, every two, two years. years. But I think no what's bad. interesting about Brazil is that you can really see the West, the disnification of the body because historically the body there's beauty was in the bottom. And now, th now there is the desire to, to be topped heavy as well. I mean, it's very interesting the Top way... Top heavy, that's a the, nice the cultural. Well, I'm top heavy, so I understand that. You told me that you were in Brazil shortly on a conference, and please tell me how you felt there. I, well, I was with a conference of psychoanalysts, not even commercial um, people, and I, I asked about some woman, and I said, isn't she nice? And, and the, the person next to me said, yes, but look at her. Look at her. How does she walk around like that? She didn't change her face. She didn't change her breast. She didn't change her stomach. And I felt, mm hmm, I am the only woman in this place who is actually not uh, being reconstructed. And som <laughs> sometimes when, I, when I'm in New York, I feel that, not with my friends, but I was talking to a New York Times reporter, a journalist, and um, she said that nobody in her office will talk about the, uh, their children. Why? Because if they talk about their children, they are revealing their ages. So that the experience... I know that problem. You do. Well. How could you? <laughs> now, what is an interesting thing I want to challenge you with is Professor Elger, the brain yeah. scientist that was here before. You, um, you, how you say, you beraten a campaign? Yes. A campaign from Dove. I think you all remember that campaign that Dove did two or three years ago, was it? Well, we started. It, we started it behind the scenes two years ago, and the commercial story is interesting. But then, right. we, then and it then came they public five years remember, ago. Remember that campaign with all these really very naturally looking women, a little different too fat, sizes, or different sizes, not different too fat, colors, of course, different just ages, nice. different um, sizes. Marie, they have different sizes. They just look natural, and they have little, you know, whatever. Oh my God, I'm so brainwashed already by all these pictures. 
anyway, and you were the counselor for that campaign. And, and the you, originator. Yeah, the originator, much better. You work with, uh, and Dove, after that campaign, had a huge success to have a 30% increase of selling. And uh, um, on the other hand, then we had Professor Elger, who was asked by, I think, Procter & Gamble, uh, to check brain scientifically how that works, if really women react more positive to these pictures than to all these idealis, idealized pictures. And uh, so he did a research, I think, on 20 women, um, and he controlled the Dove campaign versus the Pantene, Pantene Pro-V, which is as well a very idealized, beautiful young woman who, I don't know, claim that, I don't know, it's good against wrinkles or what, but they don't have any. So, um, and he really looked at it scientifically and behavior, on the behavioral side, when you ask those women, what do you like most, which women are more, more sympathetic, what do you remember better, they obviously said, and very strongly said, 90% said, we like these women on the Dove campaign, we think they're so sympathetic, We're, it's so nice, and we like to look at it, and it's fantastic. And then he put these females, these 20 women, in the brain scanner. And what he found out in the brain scanner is that the uh, affection, uh, it's the amygdala mostly they looked at, the affection center was higher with the Pantene models, the, uh, the memory building was higher on the Pantene models, and a third, a third thing too, the yeah, the memory but, how, but no, what, what, and at the end of the day, I mean, yeah, what do you say to this first? Well, then, first of all, I, I a, have the, the pictures yeah, here. Yeah, but it's a, a short, snapshot in a second, isn't it? If you looked at the Dove ads the first time, you went, just as if you had seen, you're wearing tight trousers and all of a sudden you see wide trousers, you go, ah. Oh. And then, this, then you kind of look the second time and you get interested. How does our mind change? That's what's an interesting question. Not a flash response. Of course we recognize the Pantene ad because we've seen it a thousand times. So the first time you look at the Dove ad, you go, hmm, uh. Then you go, hmm, I'm kind of interested. And then you get a delight because there is something you recognize which has not been seen for a long time. So I wouldn't take one brain study for one millisecond when we know, and I'm sure he would say that he doesn't have a good enough result. What's more interesting to me is why did Procter & Gamble go to him? Why were they so threatened that you could sell beauty on the basis of... It, democratizing it rather than excluding and creating an aspirational thing. I think they were after something else. So I'm, I, yeah, I, this, this could be, a, this is a good question. But um, I mean, could I think as we well be an explanation. It could as well be that uh, in humans we have, maybe since Plato already described it, we have this longing for this perfect form, for the perfect beauty, for but the of course absolute do. symmetry. No, and that's not true. We have a longing for an aesthetic, but our, our aesthetic, if we look over the ages, is, so, I mean, we look at people from the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the aesthetic is entirely different. Even in my time, the aesthetic has has grown, right? It has got slimmer and longer, and now it's got breasts, but it didn't used to have breasts. Or in a hundred years, it, it, but it's com the aesthetic. We have a desire. Human beings like beautiful things, but we don't only like a monochrome beauty. So it isn't that we only like one kind of beauty. So what you say is that we should allow in public space more of these, all varieties of beauty. Well, if we want to save our children, whose childhoods are being taken away from them because they are already scared of their bodies and already feeling bad at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. They're already over the toilet bowl throwing up or worrying. Yes, we have to have pictures that they can understand that they fit into this world, that they have something to contribute, and that their bodies are not the only aspect. We not only do we need to have different pictures, we need to have pictures of women particularly doing things, not just looking at the camera going, Excuse me, fuck you, but I'm so vulnerable. I'll fuck you. you know, we don't need that. We need something where we're doing something, where we show ourselves and our talents, whether we're cutting somebody's hair or we're in the science lab. I think we need to show you, women in action. You know what the, the brain scientists say as an explanation for these results? They say that uh, a, a very symmetric, a very, for us, perceived beautiful face is uh, an expression of good genes. This no, that's weird, what the evolutionary biologists say. That's they do. I, okay, but a lot of people don't think that's a very interesting discipline. Just because, 
Well, you obviously don't. But, uh, but I, I mean, a, a lot of people would say that discipline is about a kind of story about what exists. You, we all make exclamation, exclamation, uh, explanations. So that's one story of an uh, explanation. But it's not necessarily scientific. It's a story. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, okay, we had uh, Professor Hakim here yesterday, Catherine Hakim, mm -hmm. which you know from London. Yeah, she's in mm -hmm. the same university, yeah. Yeah, you're very close, but you don't love each other, obviously, because she really turned it the other way around. Uh, she said that um, there is such a thing as an erotic capital, and she came up with some studies that so that showed that uh, beautiful people it was a high, highly attractiveness got better salaries, better jobs, and from her perspective then, it was very logic to work on this physical appearance to be, you know, better rated in, in the economic sense, you know? I'm sure she's right that this is what is happening, but is this ethical, is it sustainable, and why is it, when I look at my daughter's group, of absolutely gorgeous 21-year-olds. There's not one of them who isn't gorgeous. Why is then there a competition? Because they're all gorgeous. And, but yet we know that only 2% of women throughout the world feel able to say they're beautiful, even though they, all, they look it. So there's something a little bit crazy about this erotic capital. Of course it exists, but why don't women feel it? Because actually most of them have it. Do you think that what they do a lot in media now, maybe we could show it in a picture, what they do a lot in media now is that, okay, we always, we, we're so used to see whatever, Britney Spears, who we have here, or whatever, totally reworked, and now suddenly they come up with those pictures, show them in an ugly sunlight from the back, we see the bottom of, I don't know, um, people, we, well, and we see the cellulite and everything. Do you think this will help to this schadenfreude, no, no, no. which we experience then, so. uh, this will help to bring it back to a normal proportion? Or do you think really we need this variety in the ads? No, I don't think it will help because I think those pictures are compelling and attractive because the other pictures hurt women so much. And yet it's too hard to accept how much they hurt because they are so aspirational. So I think those pictures sort of recognize that really beauty for a woman like Britney Spears, or for an actor who's this is, is What is this, the non-reworked one? Well, so, is this no, as you can see, it's been photoshopped. All oh, right, this is the, the real and the unreal but, one. But, I mean, what I think those pictures do is they show that actually to look like one way is a labor process. It requires a team of many people. It requires makeup artists. It requires lighting engineers. It requires an art director. It requires very clever photographers. And it requires photoshoppers. So the cellulite pictures are a kind of antidote to that. They're, they're antidote to the pain that that is. But I don't really think it's the solution. I think the solution is most women have cellulite, actually, and we don't, our art directors could show it in an interesting way instead of it being shown in a bad way. And we might feel very differently about it. I see. Uh, I know you don't believe me, but... No, 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 I'm totally, I'm totally, I, I believe you. I'm totally, I think you're absolutely right. And this March, you're going to have a big uh, thing We're happening. We're having Could a big the summit, end, in one in New York, one in London, one in Buenos Aires, for, to fight to preserve the female body because really we're becoming an endangered species and please if you're a body activist get in touch with us and you'll find us on the website and um, join with us to re push our governments and our commercial ventures to try to actually let people live and enjoy their bodies and really enjoy the things of food and fashion and design i think it's a wonderful thing you do very very good should we open to the public yeah. for two questions Okay, just uh, maybe two or three questions out of the public to Susie. Uh, just tell me who wants to ask a question, and I'll, I'll bring the microphone. Or if you have one ready. Is there anybody? Can no I body say? activists in here? Can Come I on. just say something a little course, bit, which I would have said? Um, I think, can I bring my slide up? Because I think we mentioned the BMI. Can you bring that slide up? I don't know where the hell it is. I don't know what I do to get it, technicals. Anyway, they're looking for it. I think one of the things that's very interesting is 
to look at the kinds of figures um, around the industries that profit from body hatred. The diet industry has a 97% failure rate. Okay? That means of 100 people who will diet, 3% will be successful. And most people over a five-year period will have gained weight from dieting. Now, the diet industry is successful because it depends on repeat customers. And if dieting worked, you'd only need to do it once. And one of the most extraordinary features of the diet industry is over the last 10 or 15 years, it has created this category of the BMI, which we was discussed before. And at the end of the talk, um, it was said that, of course, you can be fat and thi fit. And in fact, we know that a BMI in the 30s, if you're moving, is much, much more protective than a low BMI. But I think it's very important to understand that the BMI is a kind of spurious statistical whimsy. It doesn't mean very much. George Clooney is in the obese category, okay? He's gorgeous. I'm sorry. He's not obese. So I just wanted to show you that because I think it's important we see what kind of, it, what kind of nefarious practices the diet industry has. They're not on our side. They're about our money. They're about getting fat on our bodies. And it's not only the diet industry. It's the cosmetic industry. Surgery. It's a surgery in the surgical industry. So is there one question? Go ahead. Hi, um, I'd like to know if you can tell us about companies who are progressive and thought leaders who present people in motion, women in, in action, like you said. Who can we look to if we're companies ourselves who would like to explore and learn from others and do better ourselves? Who are, who are the people and the, and the companies who Well, the who fact the that way. we can't think about them, the fact that they don't come to mind is really interesting. When I worked with, was working with Dove on our third campaign, which was Women in Aging, because we wanted to show uh, creams for when you're 50, not creams to make you look younger, we got Annie Leibowitz to shoot some ads of Women in Motion. And she shot them with Women in Motion uh, with no clothes on, and they were considered too obscene for American distribution. The FCC would not allow them on the television. Um, the print ads did show women who talked about what they did and what they were like, but there are very few instances of it, and I, I, I think it's a, such a growing possibility for a commercial company because you have to think about what, what, what do women want behind that surface. They want to be understood. They don't want to be patronized. They want to engage. And I don't think it's such, I think it's hard to get it right, but I think it's a big commercial opportunity not to just show the surface. So I don't have good examples, I'm afraid. I wish I did. Yeah, Eileen Fisher, I guess in New York, is not really an international company, but Eileen Fisher, who's in fact, I think, supporting endangered species in New York, is one of those companies that has women in, in motion and in doing things. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Susie. Thank you so much for being here. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.